This is the Voice of Russia from London. I'm Tim Eckert. You're listening to In Conversation. My guest is the veteran British actress Virginia McKenna, perhaps best known for her portrayal of the African conservationist Joy Adamson in the 1966 film Born Free. McKenna's real-life husband, Bill Travers, played Joy Adamson's husband, George Adamson, and the film was instrumental in changing public attitudes to keeping animals in captivity. Together, Virginia McKenna and Bill Travers went on to make numerous wildlife documentaries and starred again in another classic film, Ring of Bright Water, inspired by the writings of the naturalist Gavin Maxwell about his life in Scotland with a tame otter. Animals and their welfare became so important to Bill and Virginia that they set up the Born Free Foundation, a campaigning charity which works to save wildlife and promote conservation worldwide. I wanted to hear from Virginia about her work with animals, but also about her film career. Many of her best-known roles were in films about the Second World War and included The Cruel Sea, Carve Her Name with Pride and A Town Like Alice. Her co-stars included some of the greats of British cinema, Jack Hawkins, Paul Schofield and Peter Finch, to name just a few. I put it to Virginia that she'd portrayed an English archetype, a blue-eyed, fair-haired beauty with a steely inner character. I've never felt at all sort of um, cool and, and English in a way. And I was thrilled to bits when later on I was, you know, played parts where I was covered in mud or, or looking disheveled because I much prefer to do re sort of real things, not too tidy and neat. I, I don't like being too tidy and neat, either to look at or in the way, uh, in the characters. I, I like to be a bit more free. But your, your screen image, I would say, was very much about that English rose image, that sort of strong mm. but, but feminine. Yes. Would you accept that description? Well, it's a very kind way of putting it. I, I never really thought about how I came across, to be honest with you. I was too interested in the character or the story or how to get the best out of a scene and working with the other actors. I'm not a terribly analytical person as far as that's concerned. I, I think about a part for a long time and a, and a story long before we start filming or doing it in the theatre, uh, thinking about it, finding perhaps different ways of expressing something, not the obvious way, and of course always being a good listener to the other actors. I always feel that the, the best thing about acting is how to listen because I watch, when I go to a, um, a show on, uh, in the theatre, I find I watch so much the people who aren't speaking, who are listening to the other actors, even more than I'm watching the actors who are speaking, because it's the continuation of your character and, and your thoughts and your feelings when you're not speaking that's almost more important than when you are. Obviously, Born Free, the film, the story of Elsa the Lioness, a very impactful film in terms of people's perception of, of Africa, of people's perception of our relationship with wildlife. But did you have any idea when you offered the part how important a film it might become? No, not at all. Uh, when we were asked to do it, and we said yes straight away because it sounded a wonderful challenge, it was actually going to be like a docudrama. It was never Panavision. That emerged and developed as the producers saw that things unusual were happening, perhaps, I think their perception of what this film potentially could become changed. And uh, so it became Panavision and all that stuff. It didn't affect the way we were working. We just did the same as we were doing it from the beginning. But we, we were just two actors. Your late husband, Bill Travers. It was not the first time you'd acted together. Oh, no, we'd acted together a lot. The first time was in a play by Dodie Smith called I Capture the Castle. And then we did a, f a comedy film called The Smallest Show on Earth with Peter Sellers and Margaret Rutherford and uh, Leslie Phillips, a cast of brilliant people. And we had such fun. It was fun. a comedy, wasn't it, about it a, a, a couple who sort of inherit a, a, a downtrodden cinema, shall we say, and have to try and make it a success. Very downtrodden. They thought it was the grand and turned out to be anything but... We'd, and we'd worked, there was a film called The Barretts of Wimpole Street in which he p played Robert Browning and um, Jennifer Jones played Elizabeth Barrett and I was Henrietta, the naughty sister. And uh, so then we were asked uh, to do this and we said yes. So off we went to Africa with our three children. Had you been to Africa before? Only South Africa in the war. I'd never been to East Africa, uh, nor had he. It was an adventure on many levels. At first... 
there were two lionesses that had been uh, rented for the film who were circus lion lionesses <coughs> from Holland. And they came, and they were nine and ten years old, sort of middle-aged, and very huge. And they came with a trainer, Monica from Germany. And um, we, we started to learn how to behave with, with these trained animals and how we should behave with them, rather. And um, both thought, as we went home at night, my goodness, how can we tell this love story when we can only move and, and, and be as we're directed by the trainer, as it were. And uh, then one morning, Bill went in for his training and this particular lioness, Astra, was in an absolutely dreadful temper and she tried to get him. And luckily, he, he managed to get out, thanks to Monica. And the producers who were watching and growing visibly pale um, decided to withdraw both of them from close work. And then we had to find, well, they had to find other animals, and they did, and from all over the place, different countries, different people, these wonderful animals came none of them trained. So the ones we worked closely with were lionesses that we grew to know, grew to respect and understand, and vice versa. We had a wonderful friendship with them, and all thanks to George Adamson, who was our, who was our lion man. He, because of his own experience with Elsa, he could talk to us and show us how to be, and we just learnt by watching him. That's how we learnt. You presumably never had experience with lions before. <laughs> no, never. The only experience I'd ever had with lions were very different and uh, from afar. Um, when I was a small child, probably about five, my father took me to London Zoo and I've never forgotten the horror that I felt when I saw these magnificent animals in concrete cages, which they were at that time. And then my second experience in South Africa as a child when friends took me to the Kruger National Park and I saw my first wild lions lying under a tree and I thought, these are the images that I've carried through my life, really, and never, never forgotten them because I always think you, ne you never must forget th those very important moments when something really hits you down deep down inside. And those two images may be subconsciously, because of those images in a way guided me to the work that we then did later on in our lives. And certainly at the end of making Born Free, and only three of the animals that we worked with were able to be returned to the wild by George following the finishing of the film, the rest going to zoos and safari parks. That again was another stepping stone into our really, our changing of our whole pathway through life really. One of the remarkable things I think about Born Free when it was first released, 1966-67, you were playing the part of Joy Adamson and uh, your husband, Bill Travers, was playing her husband, George. Mm. In the film, it really looks as if you have that relationship with, with the lioness who was playing Elsa, I suppose. Did you really establish that bond? Did you, I mean, did it, was it as natural for you as it appears in the film? Well, there were several lionesses, you see, um, which made it a little more complicated. But as we got to know them, we got to see what they liked doing best. So, for example, one adored uh, riding on top of the Land Rover. Another was delighted to ride inside the Land Rover. One liked swimming, the other one didn't. So each animal was chosen for the thing it liked doing best. I mean, we were, we were off on the planes at six every morning for two hours, with the lion we were going to work with that morning, playing football, letting her let off steam and, you know, and just being with them. Our security was the time we spent with them. Every single day, even our day off, we would always go down and see them. I think we had, I think we were given an extra day off at Christmas or something, but we still went down to see them because we had to keep that contact up all the time. We wanted to, it wasn't forced on us, but we knew that if that contact was lost or diminished in any way, they might, you know, lose interest in us or whatever, but you knew with each one how far you could go. The pressure from the producers was our problem as well because they're watching their watches and saying, hey, we've only got, you know, half a minute today or a minute or whatever. And uh, we've got to do this. And we knew sometimes the lion was fed up and wanted to stop. 
but we couldn't because of the pressure of the time for the film. So that's when they got a bit rough sometimes. Tell me a little bit about working with Bill Travers, your husband. You'd worked together before, born free, quite an emotional experience as an actor and actress. Did the two of you talk about it at the time? I mean, were you aware that this was something that was going to have a longer lasting effect on your on your lives? This awakening of, a, of an interest in in animal conservation in Africa in in how people re- relate to animals was that something that was in your head even as you made the film to be honest with you probably not as we were making it because we were so completely concentrating um, on the on the job in hand it was quite tricky but as we were coming to the end and as the issue of what was going to happen to the lands used in the film emerged that is when I think we started to talk a lot to George about things Bill said, the the only thing I want to do now is to make a documentary film about what happened to the lands. And he made his first documentary film, The Lands Are Free, which was the story of George and three of the lands going to a park in Kenya called Meru and where George started the work which was to last the rest of his life, really. Bill's whole career changed. He didn't really do a lot of acting after that. He made some amazing documentaries and he was a brilliant storyteller. He had an enormous gift, both visually and in writing, for telling stories. We didn't actually start our um, work as a charity until 20 years after we made the film. And people have often said to me, why did you take so long? Why (laughs) Why didn't you do it sooner? But it was the death of an elephant that we knew at London Zoo that was the catalyst, and that's why we started. You and Bill Travers did, of course, fairly soon after Born Free make Ring of Bright Water. We did. One of my particular favourites. And again, the two of you on screen with an animal, a very different animal, an an otter, I mean, as far from a lion as you can think. But, were you? I mean, did it occur to you that perhaps this was something you should keep doing, or was it just happenstance that you were offered that role? Yeah, we were just uh, invited to do it. We love working together and there was no effort because we knew each other so well and um, although as you say an otter is very different from a lion, we sat with the otter for several weeks and we waited until the otter came to us and of course she eventually did come to us and sniffed our gumboots and then sniffed our knees and ran up our legs and had a little look round and, and from the moment that happened we knew she would start to accept us and it was particularly important she accepted Bill because that was the important relationship. My relationship was really more with the dog, the wonderful Johnny the dog, who we actually bought at the end of the film and took home with us. I suppose we just learned from our experience the best way of doing things that would be natural and true. The dog, actually, Johnny, came from a kennels and had never belonged to anyone before. He was a gun dog. So he... He obeyed on command of the trainer, and I said to them, he has to be my dog in the film. Could he come and live with us? And then he'd be my dog. And so he did. And, of course, then he wanted to do things with me because we were friends, not because he'd been taught and asked to do it by a trainer. So it's always the way, the way you do things, and that's one of the reasons I'm so opposed to trained animals. Tell me briefly the story of Polly Polly the elephant. You said that was really a, another shift in, in mm. your life, sometime after the making of Born Free, which, of course, was perhaps the first time that people became aware that captive animals might be returned to the wild and perhaps put the idea in a lot of people's heads that training animals for circuses, keeping them in zoos in what we would now think of as old-fashioned conditions, was not right. Well... We went in 68 back to Kenya because Bill, with James Hill, who directed Born Free, had written a a delightful uh, little comedy, really, for children about elephants and this young couple, which we were then, um, going to Africa to look after some elephants. And we were working in Savo National Park where two very, very famous people, the Sheldricks, Daphne and David Sheldrick, lived. David was the chief game warden of that park and Daphne had already started her amazing work looking after orphaned animals. She had two teenage elephants, but for our story we needed a small one and she didn't have a small one. So then we heard about this little elephant 
that had been captured from the wild, taken from her family in the wild. She was two and was in the trapper's yard in Nairobi. And David and ourselves went down and we saw her and she was absolutely demented with fear. Anyway, we said to David, oh, she, no, how could we possibly work with this poor little thing? He said, if you give me a few days, I think I can calm her. And so she came and she was in our film and everybody loved her. She loved her elephant companions. She bonded with them and they accepted, of course, as elephants do, into their little group. And then six weeks were up when we finished and we asked if we could buy her. And the government said, yes, we could. We wanted to give her to the Sheldricks. And they said, um, but we'll have to capture another little animal for London Zoo because it's promised to this gift. So we couldn't, we couldn't condone it. And we said, well, I mean, you can imagine what uh, we felt it was the worst decision we probably ever had to make ever. So she then came to London Zoo and Bill went to see her with some oranges and of course she remembered him, of course she <laughs> remembered him and and then he made a decision that she we mustn't go and see her because she had to adjust to her new life, whatever that was. And seeing us would be a reminder of other times and then it might make her more sad. And so we didn't go until about 12 years later, 11 or 12 years later, we had a letter from Daphne Sheldrick, who said she'd heard that Pearly Pearly was going to be put down because she'd become so difficult. So we got in touch with a wonderful English journalist called Bran Jackman, who was working at that time for the Sunday Times, and we went. And as we approached the uh, compound, the elephant house, we saw the keepers taking her inside and shutting the door. So we never got a photograph, but Brown wrote a piece. And then subsequently, the Mail wanted to do it that following that, that same week. And so we went back and we got the picture, which is the picture to break your heart, because we went up and there she was, pacing up and down, up and down at the back. Crazy, really. We called her name and she stopped absolutely stopped in her tracks and she came and there's a very famous photograph where she's looking at us and she stretches her trunk out towards us to touch our hands across the moat and that was it um, we started to try and persuade the zoo to let us take her to South Africa where I'd found someone someone who'd take her and train her to go back into the wild and all the rest but they wouldn't but she they said she would go to Whipsnade so eventually that was the plan and her travelling crate was there, and she got used to it, and then they shut the crate. But unfortunately, they kept her in there for many, many hours, and she collapsed. She, they then jacked her up with a jack, because they hadn't got the equipment to lift her. And after examining her under anaesthetic, because she'd hurt her leg, they actually then put her down, because they said she'd lost the will to live. I suspect she lost it some while before myself, but anyway... That was it. That was our catalyst. We said, that death has to have a meaning of some kind. And we decided to start a little charity, just with volunteers, and um, we started Zoo Check in 1984. Which was to keep an eye on alert people. If you saw an animal that you felt was being kept in inhumane conditions, try to campaign for better treatment of animals in zoos. Do you have the philosophy that actually most of the time we shouldn't be keeping any wild animals? It, it's very difficult to generalise, but I suppose if I do generalise, I would say that. As far as conservation of endangered species is concerned, um, I don't think you have to have a collection of animals in order to try and uh, have a breeding programme for one or two species. If we're going to have um, breeding of endangered species, and there are many and increasingly more, unfortunately, because of what we're doing to the environment, then we have to have dedicated places for that species. So all the money, everything, all the knowledge, all the understanding, but alongside that, it's no good breeding them in captivity if they, there's nowhere for them to go. And because we are invading the wild areas in the world, and digging them up and drilling oil and cattle are going in and we're reducing the natural environment to such an extent now that that is as big a problem as actually almost the zoos themselves because there's nowhere for them to go anymore or there won't be very soon. People who 
condone or support the idea of zoos, I suppose, in general, even the most humane, they, they will always make the argument that unless people are exposed to the real animal by seeing them in captivity, they won't engage with the animal. What do you make of that ar argument? I can't believe that anyone who really understands the nature of the beast, for example, if you have a solitary elephant, when you should know that elephants are family animals, their, their contentment, their well-being is dependent on communication, on caring, on looking after and, and, and nurturing. And also, as Daphne Sheldrick said, a hundred, a hundred uh, kilometre walk is a stroll for an elephant. And here we are saying, oh, look at this nice big enclosure. It's got plenty of space for an elephant. That's nothing. It's your back garden, isn't it? If you, if you don't understand the nature of the beast, then you will accept it. But lions, tigers, leopards, cheetah, jaguars, they're carnivores. They hunt. That's part of who they are. So we have taken away a huge part of that animal's nature by not allowing that animal to express itself. And it has no choice in captivity, however nice the enclosure. It goes away for the night when the keepers have to put it. It's given what food the keepers want it to eat. Um, they sometimes, when they're group animals, social animals, not only elephants, many primates, of course, they're alone. I, I have become, in my old age, rather fierce about what I feel, because I, I think the time is very short um, to change people's minds and to change the way the opportunity that we may have to return animals to the wild will continue, because I think that is also diminishing. I mean, it's not just wild, it's the, our attitude to other living creatures and remembering that they feel, they feel love, they feel sorrow, they feel pain, they feel regret, they mourn, just like us. That's contentious though, isn't it? There's a big philosophical argument here in a debate, even amongst people, animal ethicists. There is, a, for example, a campaign to recognise some of the higher mammal species as non-human persons that's a, a movement in america particularly for mm. say marine mammals cetaceans yes an argument not to keep dolphins and killer whales Which in I captivity mm. do you go are you on that side of the fence i mean you would say we've now got to a stage where it isn't just us and animals there are animals who deserve the same sort of rights as people i i do think all mammals deserve to be treated when you say as equals, I don't really, because we don't speak the same language. They have their own language, which we don't understand. But I think any sentient creature deserves our respect and un understanding. And although uh, it's a different uh, situation for birds, the, for me, the worst thing in the whole world, practically, is a bird in a cage. Because I say, why does a bird have wings? It, 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 it has wings to fly <laughs> and it can't fly therefore you again you've 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 taken away the, the the carnivores aspect of its character by not allowing it to hunt you've taken away the birds behavioral f flying pattern and its interaction with other birds and its freedom and it's not our right to take that away from another living creature the world, as you say, is running out of space. More and more people, more and more de demands on the world to produce food, to provide living conditions, to provide clean water. There are a large number of people who say, actually, all of these wild animals, they mu their needs must be subservient to humanity's needs because human beings are more important. You know, mm. a human life is always going to be more valuable than a wild animal. We've got to the stage where wild nature those are luxuries what do you say to those people are they really luxuries after all the environment that they live in is part of ours the, the trees that give off the oxygen the rivers that we pollute all that if that all goes it's the humans that are going to suffer just as much as the animals i think the natural environment is essential to the survival of man, um, not just as a sort of fanciful going on safari, oh, isn't it wonderful be, to be out in the wild kind of uh, way of thinking of it, F truly for our own survival and not just physical, you see. I, I think there's a spiritual element to all this which is hugely important. There's something else out there 
which we ignore at our peril, I think, because it, the spirituality of life is uplifting. People who grind day after day on a, on a line in a factory or doing what they do, if they have no uplifting time in their lives, even looking at a tree, someone said to me once, oh, there's that woman, she's got these little plants on her windowsill, she lives in a tenement, and, she, and I thought, that's her need to see something living that's not a person, something growing that she has allowed to grow. That's her contact with nature and how wonderful and how sad at the same time that she's only got that little potted plant. But that is the aspect that I'm tremendously, I feel very strongly about it. Do you think people are losing that connection to a large degree in the developed world with our own relationship with nature, our own place as animals on a planet with other animals and plants? I mean, is that what worries you? The idea that we're out of step somehow with what human beings should be like in terms of how we see ourselves? In many ways, I, I, I do think that. And I think because we are being overtaken by technology. I mean, young people are so skilled at using all these iPods and pads and all these things. I can't even remember their names. But I, you know, have seen young children totally glued to the games, to this, that and the other. And I thought, look up, look out. Uh, you know, see what's around you. But they're so fixated with this. And my fear is that this younger generation of, of kids coming now, well, they are entranced by the machine, by all the things that they can do. And they can explore. Of course they can. In a virtual reality on their screen. But they're not looking at the living thing. That's what I suppose worries me. One of the most things that worry me. And, and that they're, they're going to be oblivious to the living things because they're so obsessed and fascinated. Um, and it can be very positive, but in the technology and what they can see and learn through that. And why does that worry you? What, what is the consequence of that that you fear? Well, because they won't understand. They won't feel. They won't smell the air. They won't see the trees moving. They won't see the butterfly flitting. They will on their screen, but they won't see it living. And if you don't care about what's living, then, hey, well, just why don't we chop this forest down? Or, oh, let's have more logs to build that. Or let's dam up this river. And, and who cares about it? Let's go to the river, but just to fish, to take a fish out, not to, just to sit by the river and watch it. It's all a question of degree, really, isn't it? But if you only see the world on a screen, you will inevitably, eventually lose your understanding of and sensitivity to nature, I think. What gives you hope? <laughs> well, we're not short of teachers. We just need people to listen a bit more, I think. And I'm, that's my hope, is that people will listen and pay attention and work out the priorities of this living world, which without the creatures will be a very sad place, I think. This is The Voice of Russia from London. I'm Tim Eckert, and my guest on In Conversation was the actress and conservationist Virginia McKenna.